Okay. Um, I think I'm good to start. I'm very much new to Twitch, so bear with me if I fuck some of these things up. Um, okay, before we start, I just want to know if the audio is fine. You can hear me fine, you can hear the game fine. So I don't know. Hope the setting should be okay. Um, and for some reason, the Twitch chat is not working, which is wonderful. But that's okay, because I have two monitors, I can just look at um, the second monitor, so that's not a problem. Um, okay, well, if that's fine, I guess we can make a start. Yeah, I need to update it. I didn't, because I was lazy. Yeah, Twitch chat's not working. Um, try to add the, uh, the thing, but it didn't work. Let me fiddle around with it and see if I can get it working. Give me one second. It should be in the top right hand corner, but it's not it's not there. Which is uh, really annoying. I tried getting it to work earlier, but No, by Twitch chat I mean you can't see the, the chat on the screen. That's that's the problem. Uh, yeah, the overlay is what I meant, sorry. Um I couldn't, I couldn't get it to work. Um, I added the, the widget, but uh, I couldn't... I can see it on the preview uh, thing when I click on properties for Twitch chat, but it's not showing up on the... Um, it's not showing up on the uh, actual screen, which is really annoying. No, it's enabled. Um, it should be enabled. Um, Uh, I mean, I'm really new to Twitch, so uh, is it underneath the GDBS stream? Uh, it might be. Uh, actually, that's giving me an idea. Let me move it. There we go. I think that made it work. Perfect. Big brain. Thank you very much, uh, Reaper. Right, I don't know where to put it, though, because I don't, I don't want it to... Uh, interfere with anything. If I put it in the bottom right, let me see if that is fine. Let me just move that out of the way with that over there. So where did we get up to last time? We're in the middle of Halloween. Over here. Let me just see what this looks like. Um, Might make that a little bigger. It's a little bit on the small side. One second. Uh, you feel like the top right might be better? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm gonna put it over there. Oh. That looks really weird just up there though. I guess we're just going to have chat, like, randomly floating uh, up there, but that's okay. I need the text to be a little bit bigger, but to be fair, that's something that I can fix. Um, I can fix later. As long as we can... Oh, that's a bit too big. Let's see what it looks like now. I think that looks fine. I think that's, that's good. Um, That should be perfect. I just want to double check to make sure that the uh, save uh, save stream thing is on. I'm really paranoid that uh, it isn't. I'm pretty sure it is, but I just want to double check. Give me one second. Uh, do 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 do. Uh, Channel and videos, store pass broadcast. Yep. Okay, we're good. Um, I think we're ready to start. Uh, for some reason, I can't see the Twitch chat. That's really annoying. I'm very confused. What's going on here? Like on the actual. 
Twitch. Why is it so delayed? Huh. You know what? Fine. That's that's fine. It'll do. Let's let's begin. So, um, all right. <clears throat> We're gonna start with Yuri's poem. I guess we're just gonna go alphabetically, oh, not alphabetically, but in order. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna read all of these poems because there's a lot. But something that you might find cool is that um, a long time ago, when we put out the teasers for the uh, the teasers for the Halloween um, teaser, teaser for a teaser. Wow, great, great vocabulary there. Um, the image that we used contained a bit of dialogue and echo, 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 echo. Well, I think I'm used to Yuri's. Anyway, um, I actually didn't, I didn't write any of Yuri's poems. Uh, this is when our old writer, Tactical Cupcakes, was here, so uh, I can't really comment too much on the, um, on what actually uh, it means. Also, can you guys not see the um, text box? Oh, there it is. It's just, it's, it's there, okay. That's a really awful place to put a text box, but whatever, it'll do. I'll make it bigger next time. We're learning each time. See, I don't really know what exactly this poem's about, so I'm just gonna... There's only so much I can comment on these things, because uh, I don't really remember it from a long time ago. I actually went back and I looked at um, Iris of Puzzle Syndrome, because I was really curious. The game looks really fucking creepy. <laughs> so I um, won't be playing that, because I'm a massive pussy. But it was a nice little callback to uh, Monica's real nature. Yeah, Aristu Puzzle Syndrome. It's a really good game, apparently. It's very, very disturbing. Uh, so for to Horror, I recommend it. Okay, I know I said I'll do it in order, but I lied. Um, but what I do like is uh, how each poem, um, even though the girls are in Halloween, their signature poem style still carry on to uh, their poems. So Natsuki's is very... Um, to the point. It's basically about a spooky monster that's in the dark. But shall let you read while I talk about it. I say that, but there's nothing more for me to add. Um, how did I play the base game? I didn't find the base game like that scary. I mean, okay, it creeped me out at the time, but Arista Puzzle Syndrome has a really big jump scare in it, apparently, and I'm not about that life. <laughs> I can't do jump scares. Hmm. Yeah, I'm in that Suki here. The whole uh, fear of not knowing what's there. Um, you can discuss spoilers for the base game. Of course you can. Uh, the mod, um, I would say only Siri Root spoilers. All of Siri Root, so Act 3 included. So for those of you who um, haven't played the, the rest of Act 3 or that rest of Act 2, I suggest doing that because this will contain spoilers for series route but only series route no natsuki or euro route spoilers and uh paragon you saying that you can hear a bit of corpse party in this um that reminds me i'm going to show you a track that inspired this one uh let me find it actually no it's not this track this one is just a generic halloween track there is another one later on down the line that sounds extremely corpse party like and we'll get to that later and for once, I agree with Natsuki about how, um, you know, your imagination playing tricks on you when you're in the dark is perhaps the worst part about it. Because I, whenever I'm home alone and I've played a scary game or watched a horror movie, every small sound sounds like a monster. <laughs> it's the power of imagination. And that's why games that leave things to your imagination, like, Scorp like Corpse Party, are, are really, really effective. Because um, it's a very visually simple game. 
It's, a, it's, it's, it's basically like a 2D top-down RPG maker engine, but the really spooky stuff they leave to your imagination. Which is really cool. Also, I apologise for any slurping. I'm eating noodles. Okay. Uh, Corpse Party is not free, but it's fairly cheap. Uh, it, it was on sale a while ago. Um, it's still a really good game, I don't recommend buying it. If you're into that kind of horror. Uh, let's do Monica's poem. I think this one might be a reference to um, base game. Reverie, I wake up, cold, black night, silent and still. I fall to my knees, splinters in my hand, dust in the air, cold, where am I? I reach for the light I need, is it there? The switch is pressed, I feel the warmth on my face and my hands and my arms and my... I wake up, it's all over. Cold, silent and numb, I reach my hand out. I have no eyes to see, but I can feel it. I press the switch, the warmth fills me, the dark comes again, I die again, I wake up. Noise in my ears, voices, cold, I reach out and feel nothing. Where is it? What is... wasn't it real? Wasn't it here? Everyone reaches, but nobody can touch it. The dark comes again, we all die again. I wake up. Here we go. Yeah, this is definitely a reference to our base game, which is cool. I think it's a French word. Yeah, it's a French word. Yeah, I think this was definitely written to, to a callback to the base game, which I thought was quite cool. Oh, I skipped that. Did both means switch the poem? Yeah, so Monica's saying um, it reflects on how a blissful act can make the pain go away for a little while. Uh, who wrote the poems? Um, Tactical Cupcakes, our old Yuri writer, wrote Yuri's poem. Glyph, who was our Monica writer, wrote Yuri's, I think Shaggy wrote Natsuki's, and either Brit or her sister wrote Sayori's, I can't remember which one. I, I don't write poems, I actually probably noticed. Um, this one, my old friend, there is a dark and hollow thing that follows close and to me clings, it sticks to me and turns and turns when I spin around and discern, in the dark, in the deep, the faintest shape that it keeps. It goes away when sunlight shines, the sun shines sweet and warm and kind. But does it really? Is it gone? Or does it secretly keep on? Is it really hiding there, staring from beneath the chair? Glaring from atop the stairs, nowhere but yet everywhere. In the corner, in the gap, I stare in and it looks back. Weighing, weighing, weighing down, draining, draining, draining out. I don't need to tell you what this path's about, because <laughs> it's really obvious. Um, but I think when we were, when I was talking to the person who wrote this poem, I wanted to make it obviously about her depression because I wrote the follow-up uh, text about it and uh, the two link together quite nicely. Um, yeah, so when she's saying stuff like it can, it's a, it can be about whatever you fear the most, hiding away, always there, never leaving. Even when you think it's all sunshine and rainbows, it never truly goes away. So at that point, it becomes really obvious. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's funny because. Sari doesn't confess her depression until um, November in the mod, but uh, there are uh, subtle references and some not so subtle references uh, to it throughout the mod. So it's weird because I think Sari, like deep down, she does want help for her depression. So in some ways, she does talk about it, but she struggles to actually do it. So she resigns herself to only being subtle about it. At least that's how I wrote it. Mmm. These noodles are really good. I like how everyone's just like, what the fuck? Because no one has really seen these kind of poems. Well, Yuri doesn't really mind because she's used to like spooky stuff, but the other two are like, bruh. <laughs> Hmm. 
But Yuri really enjoys it because she likes the whole dark imagery thing. Natsuki is obviously, or Natsuki I should say, is obviously not a fan because I feel as though, you know, the two girls, in terms of their writing styles, I feel like Monica and Yuri obviously have a lot in common, and then Sayuri and Natsuki also have uh, quite a lot in common with their poems, which I thought was quite cool when I was playing the game. Man, there are so many there are so many issues with music fading during Halloween. <laughs> Alright, so MC's poem. I remember when we were writing Halloween, we wanted to include uh, uh well, one of these spooky urban legends. Um and it's one that you got for the internet. And it's called Not Dominoes, but Tominoes. Tominoes Hell, I think it's called. And if you read it out loud, you'll be cursed so that something awful happens to you. Like spending 28 months writing this mod. I mean, <laughs> that's what we did. <laughs> and we certainly got cursed as a result. Um, am I going to read it out loud? Um... I mean, I could. I don't mind it, because I'm not really... Like, I believe in ghosts. So mock me all you want. But uh, I don't quite think that reading this poem uh, will do anything. But I can read it if you want me to. It depends on what the chat wants. Um, uh, and what do you mean by... Why did you switch the date of the depression confession? I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I think one of the most enjoyable things when we were writing Halloween was that we kind of got to c extrapolate the girls' personalities in that we know what they're like in DDLC, but we don't know what they're like when it comes to horror. Well, apart from Yuri, obviously. So we had a lot of fun kind of interpreting their personalities and, see, and seeing, um, seeing if uh, people would agree with how he portrayed them. And I think Natsuki could be written in either two ways. One being a huge chicken, but pretending like she wasn't to kind of maintain that tough person persona. Or two, just being a straight up skeptic. She does not believe in any of this stuff. And we went for the latter. Because I feel like Natsuki really wouldn't believe any of this crap. Um, I'm going to read it because I want to see how much worse 2020 can get. So, the CEO of 2020, if you're listening, Come at me, bro. <laughs> Alright, so Tamino's Hell. Elder sister vomits blood. Younger sister's breathing fire. While sweet little Tomino just spits up the jewels. All alone does Tomino go falling into that hell. A hell of utter darkness without even flowers. Is T Tomino... Is it Tomino or Tomino? I feel as though it's Tomino. Tomino's big sister, the one who whips him. The purpose of the scourging hangs dark in his mind. Lashing and thrashing him, ah, but never quite shattering. One sure path to Avicii, the eternal hell. Into the blackest of hells, guide him now, I pray, to the golden sheep, to the nightingale. How much did he put in that leather pouch to prepare for his trek to the eternal hell? Spring is coming, to the valley, to the woods, to the spiralling chasms of the blackest hell. The nightingale in her cage, the sheep aboard the wagon, and tears well up in the eyes of sweet little Tomino. Sing, O Nightingale, in the vast misty forest, he screams, he only misses his little sister. His wailing desperation echoes through our hell, the fox peony opens its golden petals. Down past the seven mountains and seven rivers of hell, the solitary journey of sweet little Tomino. If in this hell they be found, may they then come to me, please, the sharp spikes of punishment from an evil mountain. Not just on some empty whim, his flesh pierced with blood's blood red pins. They serve as hellish signposts for sweet little Tomino. Still here. I haven't died yet. Although it is raining uh, outside my house. And there's a little bit of... I, I kind of expected some uh, some thunder. Some very loud thunder. But alas. Zeus was not on my side. And uh, <laughs> I was watching Afro Zero uh, and his girlfriend Monica uh, play the Blue Skies Halloween teaser a long time ago. 
and uh, she she was too scared and she wouldn't let him read out loud, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. I didn't put this poem in the mod, I think this was Brit's idea, so I don't really know what it's about. I'm pretty sure it's about some kind of sinner going to hell and being punished. <clears throat> Asuki's just like, meh. It's trying too hard. Yeah, trying too hard to be edgy and smart. Uh, I'm gonna put it on auto while I slurp some noodles, so give me one moment. Oh. He murders his own parents. That's cool. That's a weird Father's Day present, but you do you. Avicii. Is that the name of that Swedish DJ that died a couple of years ago? Or am I thinking of someone else? Or is that the name of one of his songs? I can't remember. One of the two. Oh, it's spooky story time. Okay, now, uh, I can't really talk for the others, but I've got a little bit of uh, a bit of a story to give you guys for series. So let's just run through it first. Ghost story time. Um, so Sierra was looking on the internet to find some, um, and this was obviously a reference to the Russian sleep experiment. It's perhaps the most well-known creepypasta, uh, along with the uh, the Ben Drowned and the Lavender Town and the Squidward Suicide one. Um, I think it's a good creepypasta, uh, but the ending is a bit cliche. I won't spoil it, but it's really good. It's pretty creepy. Uh, give it a read sometime if you're into horror. Or not. It's your life. <clears throat> so when Sayari asks what um, what sights or sounds scare you. Um, when Yuri says silence, um, I can't remember if the answers reflect what the devs find scary. Uh, finish two innings for Natsuki Zero and you have to say you guys did an excellent job. Thank you, Lexus. We appreciate that a lot. Um, but yeah, when they, they talk about what scares them, I think the things that the Doki's mention, I'm not sure about Yuri's, I know that one of them definitely reflects mine, uh, but I think silence can be quite scary. Yeah, that's why in like in the base game DDLC, um, on the final day of Act One, when you find out that Siri has hanged herself, uh, the fact that that day has no music, so that silence is really really effective. Uh, it's crazy how <laughs> silence can be scarier than uh, music that's deliberately written to be scary. Great. Reversed music—that's something that I find really creepy. Um, I remember as a kid, I would listen to a couple of reversed uh, tracks and they used to creep the fuck out of me. Uh, especially when they had vocals. Because um, you could hear these satanic messages in. <laughs> I remember the, 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 they used to really terrify me when I was a lot younger. And even now, they just have a kind of uncanny, creepy vibe to them. I'm not sure what it is. Um, hello, Chris. How are you doing, bro? Um, okay, so when Natsuki talks about children's toys uh, and how they're creepy, like when you're home alone and you think of like a jack-in-the-box playing by itself, it will creep you guys out, kind of thing she says. Um, and MC saying that I've always found anything to do with children scary, especially in the dark. I completely agree. In horror movies, I always find, like, possessed children to be scarier than possessed adults. I don't know why. I guess it, it, it's kind of because you, um, you kind of associate children with, like, innocence. And when they're, like, corrupted by demons and shit, then that's just... That's a big no for me, Chief. <laughs> Alright, so the sound of babies crying, for example. Um, this whole thing about Sayori's horror story 
is inspired by an escape room that I did uh, in 2016. So this was four years ago now, my friends. Uh, for those of you that don't know what escape rooms are, they're basically just like attractions where you are locked in a room for an hour or however long and you need to escape. Pardon me, you need to escape within that time. And the first escape room that me and my friends did was one that was basically a haunted toy shop, which sounds a little bit cliche, um, but that company in particular is very, very immersive. And I remember when we stepped through the doors and it closed behind us, like you really felt like you were transported into a, uh, a haunted toy shop. And the story was that uh, a fire had ravaged the escape, uh, the, the toy shop, uh, and the family inside, everyone died except the father, and he had two kids, and he turned to black magic to resurrect them. And there were like Necronomicon signs and all that stuff all around them, like dolls. It was really, really creepy, right? And um, I remember the, the standout being was that we did a puzzle to unlock a door, and at that moment, the kind of ambient music cut and it was just completely silent. And that in itself was really creepy. But then we had a baby start crying. Um, and I was like, nah, fuck this. You guys, <laughs> you guys are going in first. Fuck that, man. Like, baby's crying, like, in a horror setting. Just, it, it, it creeps me the fuck out. Um, and that was the inspiration for this kind of, uh, this bit here. So he says, oh, it's fitting that you mentioned that, MC. Don't you remember the argument we had on Halloween, like, when we were 10? And then, so, the story is that they were both on their way to a Halloween party, and it was quite dark and quiet outside, you could hear everything. And she hit, she heard the sound of a baby crying. Uh, but it wasn't coming from inside anyone's house. So that's the weird thing, and where was it? Like, maybe it was out, but then you think someone would be with it, like, like walking it, maybe. Like a pushchair or whatever, or a buggy. So the fact that it was in the dark by itself with no one around kind of gets the, you know, the uh, internal alarm bells ringing slightly. And it, and it was coming from a dark alleyway, so <laughs> that's just a nope right there. Siri so wanted to investigate, but the MC was too. He was in a rush. He wasn't being a chicken, he was just in a rush, quote unquote. Um, so, they all laugh because obviously she makes the joke, but Monica realises what went on there. So, the baby's cries didn't sound natural, there was something off about them, and Monica explains it. So. Basically, that's a very popular urban legend where serial killers have been known to um, take the, 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 the sound of a crying baby and put it in a place specifically to lure out young women. Because basically, obviously, like, like if you're a young woman or a young mother, you kind of have that maternal instinct where if you hear a baby crying, instinctively you're going to want to go and tend to it. So what they do is they record a clip of the cries, hide it in a dark place, and when they go out to investigate, they attack, they pounce, they drag them away, and they do all sorts of horrible things to, the, to them. And that's why putting it in a dark alleyway is uh, a very meticulous, calculated effort to ensnare an unsuspecting victim. So it basically makes the whole idea of babies crying actually creepy because it's, like, it's got an actual basis now, and I found that really, really creepy when I was reading about it. I was like, yes, that's going in there. Uh, Miss Kasumi. Uh, that should be Kasumi-chan, but because this is supposed to be like a weird um, mixture of Japanese and international uh, perspectives, we'll let it slide. We really should have fixed that. I mean, no one's called it out yet, so it's all good. Um, and that name, Kasumi, um, is actually, um, for those of you that watched the Pokemon anime back when it was good, um, Kasumi is the Japanese uh, version of Misty, so that's a reference to Misty, basically. Because even though I don't like Pokemon now, despite my name, I wanted to include references to it, because yeah, that's weird. But anyway, she used to teach the, uh, the, two, the two kids, and we were told that she moved away to work in a different part of the country, very suddenly. And people would spread these spooky rumours about what happened, but... 
but she had a child of her own that year. So there you go, those maternal instincts. And people, the parents would refuse to talk about them. Which is a little bit suspicious when you put two and two together. But really, it's up to you to interpret. Uh, it, it, it's really up to you to interpret if that's what happened to her, or it just happened to be a coincidence. Um, whether or not this urban legend is true, well, that's for you to figure out. But Atsuki is very dismissive. Um... I don't know anything about this story, so I'm sure people have already read this, so I'm just going to skip it. Ooh. What does she even say? Uh, Animal-like growls coming... I think they got turned into like animals or something. Oh, cults. Nah, who knows, whatever. So I thought this was a pretty cool um, change in uh, perspective and the other two stories don't put you in the driving seat, if that makes sense. So it's saying that you're walking alone. In fact, I'm going to read this one because I remember it being quite good, but I just couldn't figure it out. Let's see if I can get it right this time. Uh, you're walking alone, one pale autumnal, autumnal night? Autumnal is a word? Oh, today I learned. The moon is graceful, casting her light down below like snowdrops. As you continue down your path, something shambles behind you. You turn around to look for what it might be, but all you see is a cluster of leaves rustled by the pale air. Slowly returning, you notice the lights in every house around you going out and flickering before fully extinguishing. With tentative steps, you advance towards one of them to investigate. Just as you're about to reach the window, you hear something snapping behind you. A broken twig is all that remains. Uncertainty floating around inside your head, you unconsciously start walking faster, away from the suburbs. I feel like that should be subconsciously, not unconsciously, but... Huh. Eventually, you find solace in silence, the only sound being your heartbeat. It's quiet, nothing bad seems to be happening now. In fact, nothing at all seems to be happening. Confused, you look around and see that you're in front of your house in the street. No one is stirring, nor are there any lights. Gently pacing towards your house, you go through the door. The lights are on, the television is on, but no one is in sight. This is unusual. You're expecting your parents to be home tonight. Have they gone out without telling you? No, that couldn't be it. They always let you know where they'll be. You pull out your phone and open up your contacts to give them a call. However, no one is registered in there anymore. No matter how hard you try to remember, you can't call out to them. Suddenly, there is a heavy knock on the door. Peer through the keyhole, but see no one. Another knock. Another. No oh, that's a Yandere face. <laughs> I completely forgot that that was in there. Jesus, that caught me off guard a little bit. <laughs> that was a good use of her face there. You cautiously open the door, but no there is still no one there. No one anywhere. How did this happen? Why are you alone in the piercing silence? Silence so loud that it fills the air. You do not know. There is a and there isn't any way for you to find out. That's it, what a dumb story. Um, where are the scary monsters and stuff? Huh, there is no greater fear than the unknown. Sharp claws can be prepared for, enigmatic silence cannot. I mean, okay, yeah, I can see where she's coming from. Um, I always found in horror movies where you kind of know what the monster is, it becomes a lot less scary because you know you know what you're looking for, but when you don't know what you're up against, and there's always this air of mystery, it's a lot scarier. So... That was a nice slap. Um, yeah. I'm with you there, Yuri. What's more fearful? Something you know is coming for you, or feeling safe when in fact you're not? Yeah, damn, but that... That hits the nail on the head. Alright, Monica's. Um, let's have a look. How do you make up a horror story? I feel like doing that on the spot would be quite difficult. A number of years ago, Tanabata. Tana, Tanabata? 
I think it's pronounced like that. My Japanese is awful. Had come along as it does every year. It's the story of a lost little girl. Where am I? She cried. She cried and cried, hoping desperately she could find someone to help her. But the little girl was alone. Nobody could hear her. But just as all hope seemed lost, she heard a voice. Isn't the night wonderful? The girl looked up. Where before there was nobody was now a man in an elegant yukata. He wore what looked like a noh... I'm pronouncing that wrong. Noh mask? No mask? No. No. Oh, I really should have uh, looked this up before I tried it. But it was completely blank. Behind the man stood a, tall, a stall, masks and lanterns of all sorts hanging from it. How rude of me, the man admonished himself. Welcome, dear customer. Your heart seems unhappy. Why not take a look at my wares, the man said as he gest uh, gestured to the masks behind him. Please, take one that will bring a smile to your face. There's two ones there, but... The girl looked at the masks. There were ones that looked frightening, others that looked strange. Ones that looked exotic, and many others. What about your mask, mister? The girl asked. I'm sorry, but this mask is very special. It's not for sale. The girl looked sad. I like that mask. It looks really cool. The man laughed softly. It's been called many things, but this is perhaps the first time it has been called cool. Would you like a fruit? The man asked, picking one from the tree behind him. They're sweet and delicious. Okay, I don't know about you, but if I was a child by myself and a man had a creepy mask and he was giving me a, a fruit, I would not take that fruit. The girl reached to take it, but the man pulled his hand back. Ah, they're not for children. And why did you offer it to her then, you muppet? The girl was confused. But just tonight, it should be fine, he said, as he offered his hand once again. In the festival of the night, children can become adults and adults become children. Is that true? asked the girl, and the man assured her it was. The girl took the fruit and bit into it. It was unlike anything she'd ever tasted before. It was almost overwhelming, but the flavour was wonderful. It's good, the girl said happily. The man laughed again. I'm glad you think so. There's plenty, so please eat all you like. As she ate, the man took down a mask. What about this one? The girl took the mask. It looks like me, but she looks like a princess, the girl said in awe. Do you like it? Please take it. But what about money? Asked the girl. I don't need money. Instead, I would like to be friends. Is that okay? Of course, the girl agreed. From now on, we're friends. I'm glad, the man said with gratitude. Why not put on your mask? The girl did so. She was overcome with a strange feeling. Why is it? She asked. Ah, at long last. Long I have dreamt of this moment. My dear, my Eve, my only friend. The man smiled behind his mask as he spoke as the light of the stars began to fade. For it is the festival of the night where children become adults and adults become children, let it be known. Cool story, bro! <laughs> Natsuki just does not find these scary at all. Oh, this one. Uh, I think this one, I think Brit wrote this one. And it's actually quite a good story. So this friend of mine lived alone in an apartment building. He lived in a downtown area and loved to party all night. And one night he was out, as usual. However, when he stumbled back home in the early hours of the morning, he realised that he lost his keys and was locked out of his apartment. So he ended up having to call his landlord, who was pissed at having to wake up in the middle of the night to let him back in. But in the end, he was able to get home safely, so that's all that matters, right? I could certainly relate to that comforting feeling. Right, but when he went inside, he noticed that his keys were actually on his nightstand. So he didn't lose them after all. They weren't an extra set that his landlord lent him. Wow, I'm actually reading this in their voices. Fucking hell, what's wrong with me? Nope, he was able to recognise them by the keychain he attached to it. So that's it. The apartment was locked when he got back, right? But his keys were still in the apartment. So how do you suppose he locked them in? Someone must have gone into his apartment, placed them inside, then locked the door themselves from the inside. 
and the only sets of keys were my friends and his landlord, so... Whoever it was who brought his keys back was still in the apartment when he got home. But who was it then? Never found out. Oh, fuck that, man. Like, I, I, I've heard of stories and I've seen videos of, like, squatters that live, like, inside your walls. And it's like... I saw one where it was, like, a night cam. And you just see, like, this figure, like, come out of the wall. And it's, like, this creepy-ass-looking dude. It's like, fuck that, man. <laughs> fuck that. The, uh, the, the house that I'm living in now y used to be uh, a school, or like a nursery of some sort. So, and I always said to my parents, like, what if a kid died in here? And my spirit would be there. Fuck that. I remember when we first bought the place, there were like children's drawings all over the wall. I make it look cute, don't get me wrong, but in that context, fuck that, man. Huh. <laughs> yeah, Monica. I do believe in ghosts, I said that earlier. <laughs> Okay, I believe this track was inspired by Corpse Party. Nick, now that you're here, would you like to tell the squad uh, what the name of the Corpse Party track was that inspired this one so I can find it and show everyone? Is it this one? There's one that, that plays when like you're walking around in the dark and has that really eerie instrument in it. I don't know what it is, but it creeps me the fuck out. It's when we were in that piano room. Yeah, 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 the infirmary music. Let me, let me find it. Hang on. Corpse. Console called Corpse. RC infirmary music. Is it health room? Let's have a look. I'm not sure if it's is it this one? No, it's not this one. It's one of them. I'll find it. No, it's another one. Because I think we have a, quite a few Halloween tracks. Which one's this? Let me have a look. Um. Looming Spirit. I think it's this one, Kokiri no Dirge. Uh, that sounds like it. I can't remember. Nick, you need to find him, bro. This was your music. One of your favorite games, so no pressure. Oh yes, the classic summon a Shinto spirit. What's the worst, what's the worst that can happen? Solitude, let's have a look. I think it might be this one. Corpse Party Solitude. Solitude of Frenzy. Let's have a listen. Yes, it is that one. Let me mute. In fact, let me mute this and just play the Corpse Party music instead. Just to see what that sounds like. Yeah, that fits really well. Yeah, this is the one. That actually sounds really, really good. I'm just straight up playing it because it fits, you know? <laughs> this is why I don't like playing Corpse Party. Because <laughs> it scares me. <laughs> Fucking Japanese horror, man, it's the worst. I think there's another one, another track. Because we have two Blue Skies, like, there are two tracks that, well, there's quite a few Halloween tracks, but there's another one that plays during the, the spooky bit of Blue Skies that sounds like another Corpse Party track. Dude, like, I feel as though we could make more Halloween stuff because we have the sprites and the music and the backgrounds. We could probably, like, 
make a lot more. It wasn't based on Corpse Party, it was based on that shitty Flash game, The House. Yes, okay, when that music plays, I'm gonna, uh, when we get to that scene, I'm gonna, um, play that music as well. Wait, is this the house track? Or is it the other one? No, but it was a shitty flash game. <laughs> I can't remember which one it is. Yeah, we did base song off the house. I think it's this one. Wait, let me find it. The house scary game music. <laughs> if you go to Google and type in uh, the house scary game music, the first one that pops up is the house creepy fucking theme song. <laughs> Alright, let's have a listen. Yeah, this is the one. I really hope this video doesn't have a jump scare in it, because if it does, then you're, gonna, you're all going to hear it with me. <laughs> but I remember, like, we were thinking, like, w what tracks we should use for inspiration, and then Nick used Corpse Party, which was really good. But then I was like, I remember he played the shitty horror game, and it used this music, and it had that piano, and it's just so fitting. It's great. I remember watching Vine Source Joel play this. Oh, it was so funny. Yeah, this is the entire song. It doesn't change. It's literally just this. I think this plays throughout the entire game. It's been a long time since I played it. Yeah, that's where the inspiration came from. That's a really cool CG. I remember when Brit made this. It is really repetitive. Kokuri san, have you had lunch yet? Yeah, he's having some, uh... Fish. I don't know why I said fish. Or why... Uh, anyway. Let's get back to this. <laughs> Nick, when you made this track, did you intentionally leave that really salient pause at the end. <laughs> you please tell me what I have on the top shelf of my refrigerator? It spells out dildo. <laughs> oh man, it's 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 really hard being twenty-five. <clears throat> rain. Yeah, she eats rain, bro.
So Matsuki's just like... Bro. Man, Monica. Man. <laughs> I've read much scarier scenarios than this. I think that might have been a, a, a very subtle callback to the base game. <laughs> What's the date of my death? It's funny because we're playing this now, two years later. But at the time, it was obviously... Well, I'm very surprised that no one called us out for using the English... Well, not the English, the rest of the world way of doing the day, the month, the year. Which is the way you're supposed to do it, by the way. America, get your shit together. No one puts the month first. Just saying. Wow, 2018. That was a long time ago. So they're all gonna die on the 31st of October. And then, and then Z decides to go for a piss. Imagine being British. Tuesday! <sighs> Man, you know, I have to give props to the MC for having the balls to go and uh, go to the toilet. Because, like, in this kind of scenario, I'd be too scared. <laughs> I just piss on the floor, assert, assert my dominance. I remember Afro Zero got really scared at this point. <laughs> when he noticed the, uh, noticed the glass, the figure, the, the, the figure in the glass. He was just like, nah, fuck. <laughs> I think people expected a jump scare here. And, well, they expected a jump scare in the, the Halloween thing as well. We actually were going to put one in. Um, because those, like, old school, like, 2006 era, like, internet screamers. We wanted to put something like that in. But we just didn't do it in the end. Yeah, that is a horror trope going off by himself. MC plays the scary maze game. Man, that was like the, the, the first proper screamer that I encountered when I was like 10. That scarred me for life, man. Spooky. This was a really fun thing to add, the background being very Act 2-ish, and the slow text. This part scared a lot of people. <laughs> I'm watching a, a couple of Blue Skies playthroughs, and um, a lot of people got to this part, and they were freaking out. And when the uh, spooky spirit came in, they, everyone was expecting a jump scare. <laughs> they were like scared to click, bless them. Funny because I like for Halloween this year we, we could re release like a Blue Skies Halloween Redux because reduxing mods is a popular thing right now, apparently. Um, well, we could just expand on it. It's tempting because I think we could do a lot more with this. Uh, now that we're a lot better with coding, I feel like we could add a lot of spooky things. Although, speaking of which, we actually were going to add a lot of things. So, Halloween we released in 2018 as a standalone teaser, and we had we had plans to, to actually make the teaser different, so make the full release Halloween different to the, um, the base, the, the, the standalone teaser. We were going to add Shiori in, and there was going to be like a hide and seek segment where you'd like make choices as to who you'd look for and where you'd look for them. And there was going to be like a bathroom jump scare. Um, that we had planned for Shiori, but never got around to it. I think for some people that's probably for the best. <laughs> One day, who knows? Like, horror mods are really, really fun to make. Well, I, I mean, this was really fun to make. I mean, DDLC doesn't really have many horror mods. 
The only real horror mode we have is tutorial. I don't count Siri, Day, and Nightmare because they're fucking garbage. Um, so actual ha like horror mods are really rare to come by. So again, usage of Act Two sound effects. The heartbeat was like a really nice uh, addition that we got to reuse because we all know that horror movies and horror games. If you play Dead by Daylight. Uh, the heartbeat mechanic is very um, much associated with horror, so. This music, oh, oh this sound effect I should say, is basically just, again, Act 2 dial uh, sound effects. I can't remember where exactly this plays during the base game, Act 2, because I think this is from the base game. I don't think it's like a royalty free. Yuri's poem? Oh, okay, that would make sense. I'm assuming it's on where she pisses on it. Yeah. Thanks, Yuri, for giving us all these spooky sound effects. We would. I think it would have been nice to add, like, the giggle, like, the laughter that Monica does, but I think that would have ruined it. I think it would have been better to use the... You know when you read Yuri's poem and it has that, like, creepy version of my confession there's like laughter in it that laughter would have been better because it sounds a bit more a bit more maniacal and a bit disturbing whereas the monica one just sounds like she's just giggling you know the whole squad whole squad's giggling what does poe mean it's not the kung fu panda before anyone thinks that um i i wrote this well me and brit wrote this bit together i think she wrote most of it but um I wrote the Poe. I can't remember what was the. Oh, it's just it's just it's just the noise that he makes. The oh, so we just wrote the the text to match what he was saying. Yeah, the monster is Poo Man. It, it, it's the pee pee poo poo man. Yeah, this is where a lot of people were expecting a jump scare. Uh, especially when the music stops. So here. This is where people were expecting a jump scare. <laughs> when the MC like steals his resolution and he opens his eyes, I think that that's when people expected something spooky. But the thing is, right, if we did add a jump scare, what could we add? Because... Unless we added like... No, I can't blame them. But we couldn't use, like, any distorted dohi sprites because that wouldn't really fit. So it had to be... It would have to be something else. Could have Monica, but... Hmm. And then you get the nice happy version of your reality. Which is called Lovecraft Club, I believe. The initial name was a uh, Spooky Spooky Lovecraft Club, but we changed it. Even though I think Spooky Spooky would have been great, because you know, Doki Spooky. So Halloween is like my favourite time of the year, so I love the Halloween music, it's wonderful. It's like a classic thing where someone admits to pulling a prank, but then when they investigate it, they're like, what do you mean someone else that joined in? Like, what? You see that a lot in um, TV shows and movies. And he's just like, what the fuck? Classic horror trope there. Yeah, basically, it was written to be open-ended, um, where people are like, what was that thing? Like, did you, did they actually summon a spirit? And it's like, I don't know, bro. That's for you to interpret. We specifically wrote it to be ambiguous.
wait, and that's when MC realizes, hang on, <laughs> it was Sakurai all along. Um, this is when he realizes that there's no way she could have moved the coin while she was on the floor. That's true. There is no way she could have moved the coin when she was on the floor. So that is a thonking emoji moment. I take it back. I hate Halloween. Yeah, that was really, really fun to write. Back to series route. God, I forgot that we were doing series route for a second there, because I felt like we were just doing Halloween. So yeah, it's winter now. Let's change the background to a grey version. Yeah, it was Sakurai coming for the MC for not doing his homework. <laughs> Just finished the Siri route and it was great. Thank you, spicy. I can't read. Spy. Spy Ira. That's a difficult word to pronounce. I thought it was Spicy Pirate for a second there. What the fuck is wrong with me? Alright, so this bit here, um, where she forgets her gloves. Um, for those of you that have finished this scene, um, I, we, we all know that in the base game, Sayori is quite mischievous and she likes to play tricks on the MC and I wanted to include a, a little callback where she pretends to forget her gloves in an attempt to get the MC to hold her hands because um, I, I, I really imagine that as something she would do because that mischievous side of her is uh, very... Uh, Sneaky. So yeah, she wants him to, to hold on just a little bit longer. kind of where the MC starts to break his own inhibitions and he's like, yeah, fuck it, let's, let's do cutesy romantic stuff together, why not? Even Sayori calls him dense. Classic. Uncharted Territory, that was the old Act 3 title before I changed it. So, that was a nice little remnant. <laughs> I did have a lot of fun writing this scene, I don't remember. Okay, this is a reference that I think nobody got at all, but when he says turn to page 394, if anyone knows what that's a reference to, it's actually Harry Potter. Uh, there's a scene in The Prisoner of Azkaban where Snape is like, turn to page 394. I put it in there. It's subtle. No one picked up on it. I'm very sad, but it's there. That's a very long shot, but it's, it, it's one of those... There are certain scenes in the Harry Potter universe that are very iconic, like in the Goblet of Fire, the movie where Dumbledore is like, Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? He asked calmly, but in the movie he's like fucking furious, and that's all a bit of a meme scene. And yes, that is an extremely subtle um, reference, but for those that know, they know.
Um, is that Apologies Potion? No, I think that's in the third one where they talk about werewolves. Because Snape is a dick and he wants to let the class know about Luke being a werewolf. And MC's working with Emmy. They're bowling. Yeah, Prison of Azkaban is the third one. Um, and the whole MC... I, I think Emmy being really dedicated to track and not liking when people back, like, chicken out of things, I think that's something that isn't in KS as well. She's very determined, to, uh, very passionate about her running, and she hates it when people give up on stuff. That's something that I wanted to put in uh, this as well. Uh, favorite Harry Potter movie? Probably the second one, to be honest. I didn't... The first two were good. The third one was good. The fourth one was... The fourth one was okay. The fifth one was awful. The sixth one was meh. And then the last two were decent. So... So she knows... Like, Emmy knows about Sayori. I do kind of wish that we used more of Emmy in the mod, because she's obviously a big part of Sayori's route, but the other two, she doesn't really do much. I know she's in Natsuki's route towards the at, at some parts, but she's barely in Yuri's route. She's like at the start and then like sporadically once or twice, but that's it. She has the biggest one in Sayori's route. Monica's route would have had a lot of Shiori. I'm not sure about Emmy though. They barely exist. Oh, yeah, in series root, they are in it a lot, but the other two not so much. Shiori plays a little bit of a bigger role in Yuri's root. MC, you just posted cringe. <laughs> You're gonna lose subscriber. Haha, uh, thanks for this heart funny Kalawa Shoujo reference, because Hisao's got a heart problem. You're so subtle. Emmy's just like, bro, you gotta tell him. I like how, how simple Emmy makes it sound. Oh, you like a girl? Just tell her you like spending time with her and you want her to be your girlfriend. Easy. She, she's the, the CEO of... of, of of love. Thank you, Emmy. <laughs> Never confess over text or online. It's funny that she says that because. Hmm. Yeah. The sooner you tell her, the sooner you can start dating. That's one way to put it. I could make Emmy hijack the story, dude. <laughs> Series work. So she does the MC scarf, which is a, a, a bit of a, a parallel to when MC fixed her blazer back in Act 1. I'm not sure people picked up on that.
that's when they're just complaining about how they hate maths. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen my parents using the quadratic formula or worked out, worked out the area of a triangle in real life. She has a point. She really does. Oh, this is pensive, I think. Uh... Wait, where is it? Yeah, that's pensive. I'm glad that we called it pensive. It should go smoothly, right? I'll confess to her. What's the worst that'd happen? <laughs> oh, this is the last flashback. You know, I was wondering if I should put flashbacks in Act 3 as well, or just keep them an Act 2 thing. And I think there are benefits and drawbacks of, of both options. I think just keeping it in Act 2 works because obviously the root is called past, past, present and future so it would work. But Act 3 is very different because it doesn't really focus on their past as much. But I guess I could have, I, I did actually write another um, flashback scene that didn't make it into the game. It was something to do with music, that's all I can remember. kid has played the Floor is Lava game, and if you haven't, then what was your childhood, bro? Man, that's something that I miss playing. It's a lot of fun just jumping around, pretending that like the floor was lava. It's like one of the most definitive things about childhood is playing that game. Feels bad, Kelby. Ah, uh, it sucks, bro. I, I, I mean, you can play it as an adult, but it's just not the same. There actually is a, a game on Steam called Floor is Lava and it's literally just like a, a 3D platforming game where you're in like a normal building but there's just lava everywhere and you have to like jump and stuff. I had such high hopes for that game but it was fucking rubbish. Well they have patched it a lot so maybe it's good now but I don't know. Competitive Floor is Lava esports dude. You know I'd be top 500 in that shit. <laughs> Hopefully. Pay to see me leap from couch to couch as an adult. Okay, I'm just gonna tactically not address that. <clears throat> why does so many, why are there so many mans in this room? <laughs> this was before that meme caught on. Wait, what did he say? My dad was around. Yeah, so Yuri's route doesn't really address his dad. So I think Yuri's route and Natsuki's talk about uh, start a bit more. Oh, this was in the trailer. Winter is the perfect weather to snuggle up indoors with a soothing hot chocolate and a nice book. Yuri, if I was on your route, you know, I'd be snuggling up with you right now. But, but unfortunately, I'm not.
Wait, why why are they randomly going out of focus when they're not talking? A bit weird. Yeah, that's basically a callback to Yuri's room where she likes affection, but she's not a fan of public. So, for those of you who are observant and have played multiple routes, you'll notice that who you go shopping with changes on your route. So on Sayori's route you shop with Yuri, on Natsuki's route you shop with Sayori, on Yuri's route you shop with Natsuki. If you were on Monica's route, who would you shop with? Probably Sayori again. Man! <sighs> Monica, your route. Shiori. Yeah, I guess you could do Shiori. Sakurai would be cool. Let me just write this down on the hidden moniker that we're still working on. One day, boys, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Just wanted to say that Blue Skies is your favourite DDLC mod. Hopefully it's not the only DDLC mod you've played. <laughs> um, shopping with Momsi would be really cool, but she's not returned home yet at this time of the year. So if we did have a Monokuru, probably either put Shiori, because Sakura would be a bit weird. It's going going shopping with your homeroom teacher. Yeah, that's a bit dodgy. Probably Shiori. And Mochi, because everyone loves Mochi. How are you doing, bro? How was your Dota game? Did you win, son? Um, quick shout out. Um, Crash Punk was the guy that got me into DDLC. So without him, we wouldn't have this mod. So go and give him some love. And make him feel embarrassed. It's, it's funny. Oh, we're about to get to a very big scene. Uh, the old rock band cheer reunited at last. <laughs> yeah, so two years ago, uh, me, Crash Punk, and Xenoblade Hero would go and play rock bands at a really cool gaming lounge. Oh man, those were the days. Talking about blue skies, playing rock band. <sighs> Time flies. Yeah, without Chris, DDLC wouldn't exist. Chris is the CEO of, Do of Doki Doki. I find it funny that Sayori says, um, do you have a Christmas tree to decorate? Because I've seen the memes where it's like, Sayori's hanging up all the decorations, and it's like, <laughs> one thing left to hang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm a terrible human being, but anyway. Um, so this confession, this, this, this confession scene, um, I know that, you know, in the base game, um, the confession scene goes a little bit better because she's the one confessing to us. But here, I wanted the MC to confess to her, and um, I deliberately hid the sprite because I wanted it to look like you're in MC's shoes, where you're just like looking at the floor. I can only imagine how awkward it is to confess to someone. I've <laughs> I've done it myself and it is it is pretty awkward. Um, so 
there was a lot of past experience uh, drawn upon for this scene. Uh, and it's just where well, you're kind of awkwardly just like mumbling your way through it and trading off into nothingness and cringing at how pathetic it must have sounded. Be confident, huh? It's impossible. Um, and when you hear this track, <laughs> I think you know that shit didn't quite go as well. The confession scene truly hit the hardest to me from all other versions of the confession I've seen on the mods. Yeah, it's because, uh, you know, I wanted it to feel really realistic. And I didn't like how in other mods they kind of, the MC is a bit too confident and he's a bit too much of a chat. Whereas re realistically in this situation he'd be a bit of an awkward bumbling mess. And this is basically a scene where the MC is just like very confused because Siri's like, like imagine you confess to a girl and she says, "I'm selfish." You're like, "What?" <laughs> but you can feel that something is, is off. It's wrong. She's always liked him since they first met, and that's something that I wanted to establish is that I'm not going to say it was love at first sight because that's a bit cheesy, but I think that ever since they met when they were kids, she's always liked him, and that kind of grew um, as the years progressed. And me personally, I really like it when there's a lot of contrast in emotions. So she's smiling really warmly at him, but she's crying. Um, you know, it's it's powerful that someone's smiling but they're crying as well because you think, that, you know, the 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 emotions are so strong but they're conflicting so much and that really produces a sense of powerlessness in the MC where he's not sure how to feel. Obviously, he's sad because Sarah's crying, but at the same time, she's saying to him, "I like you too," and she's smiling, so he's very emotionally confused right now. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't like seeing depressed Sayori, then you definitely shouldn't play the ballad thing, because it is very, very rough. If I can say so myself. I think that out of all the three uh, bad endings, I'm not going to spoil specifically, don't worry. I think they all hit in very different ways. There was someone that posted um, a comment in one of the feedback channels. I can't remember which one it was. But it was saying that Sayori's bad ending hits the hardest emotionally. Yuri's is more visceral and Natsuki's is, is the most shocking of the three. I think that's a pretty good um, summary. I have a friend whom's depression, coupled with undergoing a rather serious emotional event, almost led her to the brink of suicide. Seeing this confession and remembering the rest of Sayori's route has hit, has really hit close to home lately. Yeah, I've seen a lot of comments from people saying that Sayori's route, in particular, the depression stuff, really hits home because of how relatable it is. So I'm glad that people feel like it was accurate to uh, what they're going through. Not, not, not that I'm saying that I'm glad that they're feeling that way, obviously, but you know what I mean. But back to the MC being confused, because he just, he's saying that, you know, I like you, you like me too, so what's the problem, you know? And she just doesn't... Not that easy, don't understand. And this is where the MC gets annoyed, because he's trying to understand her. He's really doing his best, but she won't let him. You know, of course I don't understand. Can you blame me? I can tell there's something wrong or something going on with you. But every time I try and help, you shut me down. Is it any surprise I don't understand? I think that that kind of powerlessness is something that I really want to put in the mod because when people think that we, we've we turned DDLC into a dating sim mod, they're going to think, oh, it's just going to be like a typical cutesy, nothing goes wrong kind of thing. But like purist mod, um, I don't... Okay. I'm going to be honest, I, I've i spoken to the Purist Mod devs about Purist Mod and, and, and they themselves aren't very happy with how how it turned out. But one thing that I, that I really thought when I was playing Purist Mod, seriously, was that 
it didn't feel like a healthy relationship. And it didn't feel realistic either, because it's one of those classic MC loves that you're really fixing stuff problems kind of thing. So, I can't remember where I was going with this now. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Yes, I'm doing the good ending first, then I'm going to do the bad ending. Um, this route has helped me to understand depression and how to better help my friends through it. I mean, that's wonderful. I'm glad that you know it helped you in that sense. I didn't. I didn't write. Um, I, I. There actually. Okay. So, in Act Three, if you choose to go with Siri to therapy, there, there, are, there's that day where she goes to. Um, there are days where she goes to see uh, her doctor or a therapist, but if you notice, the day actually skips. Skips the actual day. You don't actually see it. When I was writing series route, and in the the, the draft, the the outline plan for her route, there were actually going to be um, there were actually going to be therapy scenes, like actual therapy scenes with an actual therapist and doctor. But while we were going through that, I felt like it'd be too preachy, and I didn't want to kind of rub it in people's faces. It's like, oh, look at me, I know depression, like, that's not what I wanted to do, so we cut them. But there are still traces of that, that remain in, um, in the route. Like, for example, when Sari th- uh, talks about how she challenges her, um, her, her depression. Because I, I, I really don't like it when, when mods are idealistic. Especially with depression, because I've always thought that writing a DDLC mod, or at least a DDLC mod that tries to handle these problems, depression, self-harm and abuse, there's a certain responsibility that people don't realise. That when you, because these topics are so heavy and they're so personal to people, if you write a version that comes across as idealistic or toxic or unhealthy, I think you'll be sending the wrong message out to people. And I really didn't like how in Purist Mod, there's no real development from Sayori. It's just kind of, she has a sad, a sad moment, MC comforts her, and then she's okay. And then if you get the good ending, it just ends with, so the whole therapy thing, it just says in like one line at the end, oh, six months later, sayori has been doing therapy and now she's much better. And it's just like, bruh, where was my role to play in this? I, I, I felt like the MC didn't really do much. You know, in in terms of that, uh, purist I felt was rather I- idealized and un- unrealistic in terms of how depression was resolved. I completely agree, um, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to write Blue Skies was because I wanted to portray mental health in a way that I felt was correct. Now, I'm not saying that I'm the expert. I'm not trying to say that at all because I'm not. But I just felt that the way that other mods portrayed it was a little bit too fairy tale like for me, and. I'm not saying, okay, I understand why people want happy endings for their doki, so don't get me wrong, like, I completely understand and that the base game obviously is a very bittersweet feeling, so I, I, I know why people want to see them happy, but I still think that when you've got things like depression and mental health in the way, you need to be really careful with how you handle it, and I think purists really miss that mark. So, uh, enough shitting on other mods, let's carry on. Yeah, I think it's the the purest mod like six months later retrospect video. I watched a bit of it, and most of it w- was just shitting on that Siri rewriter. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, this is not a purest mod stream. This is a blue sky stream. Um, and RMC has always had that ability to understand Siri. He 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 knows instinctively when something is wrong up with her, um, and that kind of care has always been something he's had. The horrible nightmare when she was off school, um, the poems that she writes, and he he brings, he specifically brings up things from months ago, like the poem, the fairy tale poem that she wrote, and, and the nightmare that, he, that she had. He remembers exactly what she says, saying that, you know, she feels useless, she doesn't want to do it anymore. And it's it's at this point where you you well, uh, how it was intentionally written was that you b- b- because you as the player know that she has depression but the MC doesn't. I think one of the best things about dramatic irony, which is when the player knows something the characters don't, is that you really want 
them to catch up to you, basically. And you want the MC to know what we know. And that's why I think dramatic irony is a really powerful uh, device that people use in, lit in uh, literacy. And, you know, he thinks that someone has been saying things to her. He thinks that someone else has been saying to her, you're useless, you shouldn't do it anymore, why are you bothering? And he gets really angry saying, if someone's been saying stuff, tell me and I'll go and... I'm sure you can imagine what that one is going to be, but... He's really protective over her. But he, he, he's clenching his fists so hard that he can feel the nails digging into his palm. And then she says, it's me. And then she... The MC's like, what? That was actually the, the last thing that he expected to hear. Like, you're saying stuff to yourself? Just We're just going around in circles here. And then she says it. And it was really, 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 really important emphasis on the really that I know a lot of people give the MC flack in the base game for how he dealt with her depression. He says, I, I feel like I've been betrayed as your best friend. And was that a, a, a smart thing to say? No. But I don't think, especially in the context of how inexperienced the MC is, I don't think he, he meant it maliciously. I think it's just the case of he's known her for so long and she's been hiding this big thing from him. He feels like he's been betrayed. Obviously, it's not the right thing to say at all, but I can see where he's coming from. But I really wanted to make sure that our MCs were different and that his reactions are very different to the, to the base game's MC to really drive home that point that the two MCs are very different people. But he still retains base game characteristics because we didn't want to make him too different like Fruits of the Literature Club's MC, who's... <clears throat> At least, like, our MC is very aware that his response wasn't very good when he says that's probably the most lackluster response I could have given you. Because he's, he's self-aware enough to the extent that he knows that he's a bit of an idiot. And he's just... He apologises, but Sarah's like, don't be sorry. Like, I wouldn't have expected you to know how to respond. And he's just like, I don't, I don't know what to say. I, I had no idea. Like, you always seem so happy. And she was really scared that, you know, she would let that mask slip. And she really thinks that the only thing she can give people is, ha is happiness. So if the MC sees what she's really like, he wouldn't want to be with her anymore. Or want to be her friend, which I think is really, really sad. Momsy is the girl, yeah, she is. Again, this is a reference to how people with depression typically, you know, it really interferes with, with your... Um, diet and your appetite. And it's really sad because when she says for the first time in what feels like such a long time, that's referencing that before the MC came back into her life, obviously, she didn't feel the kind of happiness that she feels around him anymore. And that happiness felt alien to her. And it wasn't much, but it was enough to help her get through those days. And when she says that she she wanted him to warm her hands up, she feels guilty for asking him to help her, but sometimes she just couldn't help her. It's, it's so hard to fight against what her own heart wants. And then when she, she fell in love with him, um... Oh, fuck! No! Oh, fucking hell, of course I clicked the skip button. God damn it. And Halloween is so far back. Fuck. Okay, let me just try and salvage this. Okay, it's not too far. So, when she, um, says she started to like him, it scared her because 
she's really scared of her own selfish needs even though it's not selfish for her to like him at all but that's just the way her depression twists her, her mindset and she feels selfish dragging him into her mess and that really she shouldn't be bothering with him and the sad smile in that she thinks that if her being miserable would actually put him off but it turns out that he didn't mind at all and it actually made him want to be around her even more no, she, he stuck around and tried his best to comfort her even though she was horrible to him and kept him at a distance and now she's at a point where she wants something that she's scared of in that she's worthless and she couldn't care less about herself and she doesn't want other people to be happy and now that I've messed I've messed that up because now you know about my depression and now you you'll definitely worry and she's really, just really apologetic just for once just for once she just wants to tell those selfish that selfish inner demon to just shut up she wants to embrace the selfishness and be your girlfriend and I remember I, I, I wrote this when I really liked Sayori so I thought what would I say to her and I think reassuring her that she wasn't being selfish was perhaps the biggest uh, priority at the moment and he wants to hug her but she doesn't want to be hugged and she actually pushes him away and that's something that really surprises him and she asks him to leave it's kind of like the nightmare scene where you know she he sees her having a nightmare but she tries to brush it off and the MC reluctantly obliges <laughs> but now she does the same thing and MC's like like how can I leave like you've, 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 you've told me that you've got depression I can't just leave, that's impossible. And again, anger. In what I was saying earlier about how when MC feels very emotionally overwhelmed, he gets angry very quickly because he can't make sense of this. So I'm allowed to tell you my problems and you're allowed to cheer me up, but I'm not allowed to help you. I think that was perhaps the most powerful response that he's given her because while I, I understand Sayori's point of view it is very it's it's from MC's perspective it's a one-way street because he says to her I'm feeling lonely my parents divorced thank you for letting me come back into the club I really enjoy it and he just wants to um, he just wants to kind of uh, give back to her but she won't let him, and that's really frustrating because it feels like a one-way street. I think maybe he went a little bit overboard, but we had to write the MC as not being perfect. When she says, you'll never understand, of course I won't, because you never let anyone in. And that's a problem of MC not being able to understand because they don't let him in is an issue that you see in the other routes as well. More specifically, Yuri's, for those of you that have played it. That should have played the um, ring sound effect, but whatever. I think what really establishes Mom C as a mother figure in that she doesn't just tell the MC off for shouting at her. Like, for example, it, like you told like Monica or Natsuki, they'd probably say like, yeah, you handled that like an idiot. Well, not those words, but they'd probably be a bit more uh, stern with their uh, reply. But Mom C knows what it's like to be in this situation. And she really empathizes with the MC. And that's why when we were writing her, it was really important to, to make her someone that understands the problems that the MC has and doesn't just chastise 
the MC. She kind of understands why he flipped out and tries to be um, comforting, but also from a pragmatic point of view, helpful in that sense as well. Exactly, so when she says, no, shouting at her wasn't the best idea, but it's not like you set out to hurt her, is it? And I think when people are in arguments and they reflect on, on you know, the, the, not, the horrible things they've said and they feel guilty about hurting people, it's good to have that voice of reason to, to, to ground you and think, well, you didn't set out to hurt someone, it's just it happens during arguments, so don't beat yourself up about it. And yes, it is one of the hardest things to watch someone we love suffer like that. Um, one of my friends has a really bad case of depression. And obviously, we're not lovers, but <laughs> um, it is very, very difficult to kind of stand back and watch someone you, you really like battle this by themselves. You feel like you can't help them. And we just don't understand it. We can't see why they say such negative things about themselves. But Exactly, like it didn't feel like even that, that was even Sayori, it feels like someone else. And he thought, he thought that days where you're in a low mood is completely normal, which it is. When people have bad days, it happens all the time, right? But the worst part is that it's so loud and convincing, and that it does dominate the thoughts of whoever's got it. Depressive thinking, and I remember we studied that at one point in psychology and it's just rational thought is just swallowed up by depression and it's just twisted to suit the depressive narrative that the, the horrible voice uh, holds and it is an illness it's a mental illness that can be just as dangerous as, uh, or just as uh, significant as a physical illness and this, Momsi is saying something I wish this country would recognise, is basically calling out Japan's mental health uh, kind of attitude, because it's very, very poor. That's why suicide rate is so high, along with their, uh, their work ethic, but those two things combined. The most important thing is not to expect a quick fix. It's not something... <laughs> this is a bit on the nose, but it is just calling out Purist Mod. Because obviously Purist Mod does use power of love. Yeah, the US hasn't been much better. Um, but at least the US is an individualistic society. Whereas Japan is collectivist, which basically means that the needs of the group are... Uh, prioritized over the needs of the individual. So for example, in the workplace, where Japanese people overwork themselves to the death, like part of the reason why they're reluctant to take time off for themselves is because they don't want to let the rest of the team down because of the collectivist society that, that they live in, whereas the States at least places a lot more emphasis on the individual. But yes, I do agree that uh, mental health issues, uh, the approach is very, has a long way to go, but it's a start at least. Is Yuri implied to have borderline personality disorder? No, she's not. I mean, uh, let me very quickly have a look at the symptoms, but I'm pretty sure... Extreme reactions to being abandoned, unstable reactions with other, uh, react relationships with others, confused feelings about who you are, being impulsive in ways that could be damaging, regular self-harming, long-lasting. No, she's definitely not. No, just because she self-harms and has issues with like, and being clingy and stuff doesn't mean she has borderline personality disorder. She doesn't fit the symptoms. So when Momsi talks about how um, Sayori doesn't have the energy to get out of bed and days where she just doesn't feel like talking to anyone, again, the, the, the friend that I had that, that has depression, I would 
there were days where I'd say, hey, do you want to play t like TF2? And he'd just say no. And at first, I didn't know how to deal with it. But then you kind of just accept that there are just some days where they just don't want to do anything. And, and that's something that you have to learn to deal with. And days where you don't get out of bed, like missing school days is, is because of depression, is completely um, uh, normal. But yeah, Mom C is like, she's woke. She knows her shit, man. And it was really fun to write her because um, unlike the MC and the girls, she's a lot more experienced with the world. And being able to write a much more mature character who has that wisdom was a nice change of character to write, change of pace. And yeah, what she says here, Never underestimate how helpful it can be just to listen to someone's problems and worries. Just having someone listen can be so helpful, more than you could ever realise. And that is advice that I think is completely true. And if there's one thing that you can take away from this mod, I want it to be that. Because I think some people will feel like, oh, if someone has depression and they're having a really bad day, you could feel powerless because you think, oh, I can't help them, I'm so useless. But just letting them talk to you is... Um, Something that really helps. Again, she mentions that therapy and medication oh, don't always work for everyone. Don't see it as a magical fix and it'll take time. Because, again, other mods that say they went to therapy, everything was great. It's not, it's not how it works. It's not a magical fix. And I don't want people to think that that is true. Purple Nerd 23, I appreciate the host. Thank you very much. I'll make the uh, little uh, pop up that say people are hosting you or whatever, or, or subscribing. I was meant to do that today, but I came back from tennis really late and I didn't have the time. So I only got to do the, the widget instead for chat text. But it's something. I thought about when MC said that use condition may not be cured, it only comes to a remission, which is similar to how BPD works. When I was waiting, when they were going to call my name, they didn't. Um, no, I mean, the, the problem with borderline personality disorder is that Yuri doesn't have those extreme symptoms. Like, self harm doesn't necessarily need to be a symptom of a wider mental health um, condition. Uh, you guys need to deal with get verified by Twitch that we can sub. I would if I knew how. I'll figure it out after the stream. As you can tell, I'm really shit at Twitch. Um, as someone who deals with depression, this is really good advice. Well, I'm glad that uh, you think so, Purple Nerd. Because the last thing I'd want to do is give out <laughs> incorrect or unhealthy advice. That's the last thing I want to do. Yeah, self-harm does so many different causes. Who is playing? Uh, it's me, Sus Wampa. I wrote series three. Probably should have changed the title. In fact, I will change it to part two. There we go. Okay. So when I wrote this scene, um, where it's kind of a little bit of downtime, it was basically to, to kind of reinforce how 
no matter what he does, uh, Sayori's condition will always be in his mind. So he just can't kind of get away from it. We need to say that not even the escapism from video games is doing the trick. If I should go for a walk. See you later, Paragon. Have a good one. This is actually one of my favourite scenes from Series Route because this was the first time where I got to write for, for, like properly for another girl. Uh, this one being Yuri. And I think this is just kind of a precursor to how Yuri became my favourite Doki because her, her dialogue and her character I feel like is perhaps the most fun to write for because she kind of has that mature, um, that kind of mature insight that you don't really get with the other two girls. I mean, you would get it from Monica, but obviously no Monica route. But also, Yuri is the subplot focus of series route, um, so it's fun to add her in there. Um, oh, I'm glad it gave you some new insight, uh, Jayla. Uh, one of the few things I'd say is don't try and pressure someone into doing something that'll just make them break down and feel worse. I completely agree, um, especially when they have depression or any pre-existing mental health condition. It's really important to be aware of their boundaries. Like, encourage them, sure, but don't force them. There's a big difference between the two. I think the scenes with characters whose route you aren't on are the best. Um, yeah, I can see that. Because it kind of shows that, you know, they're still there, and they've still got their role to play, even though you're on a girl's route. Plus this music. I think this is... This DDLC motif playing right here. I love it to pieces and it fits the conversation that he has with Yuri is uh, wonderful. It's like kind of... I don't know how I'd describe the track. It's not melancholy, it's just kind of... I think it, 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 it's sad, reflective, but with a little bit of hope in it. That's how I'd think about it. It's soft. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way of summarising it. This was definitely a track that I was inspired by Katawa Shoujo. Yeah, I'm not sure if Nick's here, but if he is... You know I love your music, bro. This is a fantastic example. I think this is actually a Monica track. Yeah. Here it is. I'm not sure what it is um, about the dynamic of talking to someone and having an important scene with them where they're not the girl's route that you're on. I just think because, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do was kind of make it so that uh, the world still feels alive. Like, so you're in Sayori's room, it's like everything is Sayori. And I think keeping the other girls in the focus or having big scenes with them just kind of makes it feel more alive and it was just really fun to write for that reason because I know that multiple people like I, I, I like to me I, I think it's rare that you have someone saying my favorite Doki is this character and I don't like any of the others like nine times out of ten it exists on a scale people saying favorite Doki is Sayori then Monica then Yuri blah 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 so we, we kind of want to like pander to not pander but we kind of want to appeal to people as well who like multiple Dokis, and I found that people, a lot of people like Yuri, a lot of people don't, but hopefully those that like Sayori um, enjoy Yuri's presence as well, because I feel like um, Sayori is kind of, she's kind of silly, but she's very sweet, 
not particularly mature. Not that I'm saying that as a bad thing. And it kind of contrasts against Yuri, who's not really playful as such, but very mature, very elegant. I think having those two things combined in one route kind of gives you the best of both worlds. I think people like multiple Dokis, pretty much. Uh, this mod does a great job of not villainizing other Dokis when you're not on their route. Too many characters, character mods have that, so not villainizing at least one Doki or sometimes more than one. Uh, yeah, I I agree with that, uh, Daikaju. Um, I haven't played Fallen Angel, but I've heard people complain about Monica's characterization in that. Um, Apparently that villainizes Monica, and then you've got exit music, which villainizes everyone. <laughs> so it was really important that no one character was a villain in Blue Skies. I think some people thought that we kind of were a little bit too harsh with Natsuki being antagonistic in the festival. And looking back, yeah, I can agree with that. But if you play Natsuki's route, you kind of get an understanding of why she is like that. And I hope that people kind of realize that that's not her character. It's not all her character is. Like, there's a reason why she acts like that. Um. I think it helps separate the mod from other visual novels which have big trope problems. They often focus on one character completely and that's completely, that's super unhealthy in reality. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I, like Katawa Shoujo for example, um, if you play on Lily's route, there's, it's not like you forget about the other girls. Um, and I think just keeping the other girls included is really important because realistically, if you start dating someone, the other people aren't just going to disappear, right? They're still going to be there, just in a different way. And it was really important for the mod to reflect that. Um, I'd say nobody's at the bottom of my list. Then again, it's helped me to help people or dislike them. Yeah, I mean, I, people like multiple Dokis, so we kind of wanted to include that love no matter what route you're on. I think all four girls star on all three routes, regardless of which route you're on. There is some variance. Obviously, Yuri plays the biggest role in Sayori's route. And Monica plays a really big role in Natsuki's, and obviously Sayori in um, uh, Natsuki's room. So. Yeah, because I feel like Yuri, the characterization for Yuri has been very hit or miss, in that some people paint her as this deranged, crazy yandere girl, and we wanted to kind of give her a more human approach. Um, we really wanted to make her feel like you know, an actual human being rather than just a stereotype or a crazy bitch. Um, and especially on her route, it really delves into the psychology behind why she is the way that she acts. But also keeping her as a nice, reasonable, mature... Like, basically, I don't think people like Act 2 Yuri, because, yeah, it, it, it's, it's pretty interesting, like, the base game. Like, I, I don't think that, that the base game would have worked if Yuri was Act 1 throughout the entire thing. But I think that if you characterise Yuri based on Act 2, that's a big problem because that's not who she really is. So. And I also like how she's really understanding and really mature. Like, she basically asks, what did you guys fight about? Um, and the MC is like, I can't tell you. And instead of like being pushy or being nosy, she completely understands and she backs away. You know, realizing it is quite a personal question. And, if you look at the base game, um, Yuri in Act 1, I'm not really going to focus on Act 2, but in Act 1, Yuri says things and then she feels really embarrassed. She says, oh, I, I, I'm an embarrassing person, I'm a, I'm a bad person. And MC is the one that kind of reassures her that she's not. Whereas here, it's actually a flip in the dynamic where now MC is the one saying, I fucked up, I'm a horrible person, and Yuri is the one comforting him. So it's really fun to explore flipping that dynamic, because Yuri is often always the person being comforted rather than being the comforter. I don't know if other mods really explore that as much. I haven't played Outcast or Fallen Angels, maybe they do. 
I just felt like that was a really interesting dynamic to explore because everyone is used to Yuri being the one um, needing help, not the one providing it. Yeah, we wanted to make them feel like actual humans rather than just walking stereotypes that exist in a visual novel. Humanizing them and fleshing them out, making them feel like actual characters was our goal from the start. That was like one of the core uh, tenets that we really wanted to drill home. And when Yuri is saying that, you know, please believe me when I say that you're not an awful friend. I don't know what was said between you two. But everyone says things they don't mean during arguments, especially when tensions are running high. And it's funny that Mom C is a really mature one, and yet they're basically saying the same advice. It just goes to show how insightful she really is, and despite her not really being the best with people, she's still quite tactful when it comes to social interactions like this. She knows what to say. And she uses like a real example, saying that you know, when she had that fight with Natsuki in September, she said some pretty hurtful things, but she didn't actually mean them, and she, she feels like Natsuki feels the same way. And so please don't be too hard on yourself, and you know, she knows that Siri means a lot to her, and that you're really, so, you're really kind and patient with her, so don't beat yourself up. same time, even though she's really, you know, insightful, she always falls back on classic Yuriism. Sorry, I didn't mean to sound presumptuous or anything. It's <laughs> great. And he calls her a really good friend and it's just like, she doesn't know how to respond. Oh. Oh, Yuri. Yeah, her... her Shyness has been very endearing because it clashes against the intelligent, mature outlook so much. <laughs> and this is you know, a slight callback to her route where she says that she wishes that other people would be as accepting as MC was and inclusive of those with interests that go against the norm. And when she's picking her sleeves, I'm, you know, I'm sure you can tell what that's a reference to. It's a really nice little wholesome scene that you get after a very emotionally heavy one. <laughs> yeah, it's meant to put you on high alert because their problems don't disappear um, in this mod. Like Yuri still cuts in series where Siri's still depressed in the other routes, so. Sakurai's humour was a lot of fun to write. He's got that kind of light-hearted, self-deprecative vibe. Um, and, I, and I like self-deprecative humour, but it has to be done very carefully. Because if you do it too much, or do it too hard, it comes across as really uncomfortable. But if you do it every now and again, I think it's great. Does he really live alone or with some relatives? Um, I feel like answering that question and discussing it veers into spoiler territory, so I'm not going to answer it. This is a nice little bit that kind of shows that Sakurai isn't just a teacher. Like, he actually cares about his students and he actually talks to them if he feels like they're not themselves today. 
And that, most importantly, he doesn't tell off the MC for not taking, like, a lot of notes. Like, he, he can tell that something is up. So instead of being like, why aren't you working? He's, like, saying, is everything okay? Normally you're on top of everything, so I want to know if you're, like, if, if there's anything you want to talk about. Which I think is, is a nice little touch, because teachers... Teachers aren't exactly what come to mind when you think of, like, people that you can talk to. At least for me. I wonder how many people um, thought that Cesare was dead at this point. <laughs> she didn't come to school, didn't answer MC. And now MC kind of beats up, beats himself up because he's saying, oh, all the little jokes I used to make about her being lazy, not being able to get out of bed. Why is it our brains are so good at reminding us of times we said or did things we really regret? That is so true. I think we've all had that experience where we're about to go to bed, we're tired, and your brain's like, hey, do you remember that time you really upset someone? And you're like, can you fuck off, please? Obviously, that voice of reason saying that he had no way of knowing, but that guilt is just so overbearing. So what's interesting about this scene is that initially, in the first build we had about to Sayori, uh, the MC actually received some homework from Sayori's teacher and he was told to give that to Sayori. So what that approach means is that he's the one that approaches her. And obviously the, the makeup scene is, is pretty much the same. But there was feedback saying that that felt like it was resolved a bit too easily and that it's just like a coincidence that he was given the homework and had to give it to her and that's how they resolved it. So he changed it so that she was the one that came to him. Um, why does Monica look weird? Um, I wouldn't say she looks weird, I'd say she looks different. Her sprite is side on rather than facing forward to signify that she's not sentient anymore. Let me see if I can find an example. Wait, let me just save the game real quick. So if you look here... That sprite is side on, like the other girls. So it's different, you're not used to it. But it's there for a reason, it's to signify that she's not sentient anymore, because obviously in the base game she faced forward to... Shut up, she was sentient. Well, not the case anymore. Um, if I remember correctly, you said you didn't have the intent to put OG references with Siri missing. Well, I think Siri missing isn't as much as a reference as saying stuff like gently open the door. But I did want to play off the idea that she's missing and uh, make people worry a little bit. Um, all of the characters sort of face to the side. Monica was the exception, yeah. Yeah, it does mess with your head. Although, when I see the base Monica, that throws me off because I'm so used to the Blue Skies one. But that's just me. It's one of those things that'll grow on you. Hopefully. Um, hello Fortnite fan. I'm okay, how are you? Hope you're winning that chicken dinner, bro. Um, so, I personally think, right, when there's been a big argument and people blame themselves 
I feel like that's healthier. He healthier. I can't speak English. That's healthier than blaming each other. I feel like when you kind of own the responsibility yourself, when both of you do that, um, there's a kind of shared responsibility in it. And I think that's a lot more beneficial to maintaining a, an honest friendship than it is from blaming each other. <laughs> and she was really scared that, you know, after their fight she pushed him away. And she's just crying and she was really sad and all that stuff. But um, BMC reassures her saying, you know, you can never push me away, I'm your best friend. Which is nice. And he's just, you know, talking about how guilty he feels for making her cry. But she reassures him that, you know, can't really blame him because she was being very... She was putting him in the dark, basically. And I wrote, um... I wrote, um... The scene specifically so that Sayori wouldn't hold a grudge. I don't think she's the kind of girl that would. She really strikes me as a girl that would forgive and forget quite quickly. Um, so that's why she can never kind of remain angry at the MC. Is it odd that in the argument I'll take the punishment for the other person? Um, I can't say I've heard of that. I'd say it's certainly uncommon. I'd say it's more common to either blame yourself or the other person. But I've seen people play this on YouTube. I don't remember the developer. Well, I'm only one of... Like, I'm not the only developer. There are other developers on the team. I'm just one of two senior developers, along with Curie, the artist. But she's not... She's not here. But I'm one of them. I'm not the only developer. It's really important that everyone knows this. Because I don't like taking credit for things that I didn't do. It is funny because they both thought that the other person didn't want to see them, but in reality, both of them did. <laughs> it's crazy how communication can do that. Or lack of communication, I should say. It's kind of uh, a testimony to how quickly they make up in that soon he's just, you know, making jokes about how she spilled stuff on his shirt before. <laughs> they both share a laugh. Like that. And here he's really trying to do his best by being as, um, understanding saying look I understand how you feel but if you don't feel like you're ready to have to go into a relationship yet and that's fine um, I just want to go whatever pace you're comfortable with and I think that's kind of a hallmark of a really understanding person putting your own wants so putting someone else's uh, kind of wants and desires before your own She's saying like, "What? Well, I hate to drag you down and to be involved in my mess." But he does, re he does reassure her, saying that it's his choice. He's the one choosing to get into it. He's choosing to get involved because he wants to. Because you know, he he likes her. He doesn't see her as a burden at all. And it's really important to know that if you feel like you're dragging someone down, just bear in mind that it's always their choice. Like no one's forcing them to do it. I know if you have depression, in the grand scheme of things, probably not very helpful. But just something to bear in mind. And he's just saying, you know, you, you give so much to other people. Would it really be so wrong for me to give something back to you in return? And just reassuring her that, you know, 
She says, oh, well, there's so many other people out there who are worthy of your time. And he's saying, yes, there are other people out there, but there's only one you. You're the person I grew up with. Also, when MC mentions that someone her boyfriend and even being in a hospital, it's Kaya says MC, uh, Kaya's main character, uh, Hisao, is he here? Um, that's another you can interpret, uh, I think. And for Sayori, hearing that she's the reason why the MC's childhood was so uh, happy and enjoyable really means a lot to her. Because obviously her personal philosophy being make other people happy. And then that, learning that years of someone's life being, you know, so joyous can be attributed to her really means a big deal. I feel there's a deeper pressure, a deeper problem with people that have depression, that just stay here and don't talk to anyone. Yeah, there are some people who wouldn't talk about it at all and would hide it a lot harder than Sayori would. MC Hisaru. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. And it was really important that just because they have a makeup scene, the depression is still there. It's always gonna be there. It's not gonna go away just because they they make up after a fight. I'm not sure if some people expected Siri to be like, oh yeah, let's date straight away just because they have this makeup scene. It's not how it would go. And you know, the MC is disappointed by that. You know, he 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 still finds it discouraging to hear that, you know, she feels that way, even though he was told to expect it. I think being told to expect something and actually feeling it are two very different things. He's really, yeah, he's really starting to find out how difficult this can be. But he, he's, he's kind of worried that he doesn't want her to feel like she needs to date him because it's what he wants. Um, but she reassures him saying, no, it's something that she wants as well. I would say that the amount of people who know I have depression is in the single digits. I know a lot of people, it's really not something. Else. Yeah, some people feel like if you find out that they have depression, it they wouldn't, they were, might be afraid that it might change how they're seen or they might get special treatment or anything like that, which I absolutely don't want that to happen. Um, as of, I was thinking of things logically almost all the time, there's a word for it, but I may address the idea that the grand scheme of the universe, I'm not even a speck of dust. Well, I think that approach of I'm a speck of dust in the grand scheme of the universe is... I'm not gonna say it's unhealthy, because it's not, but I just think that if you think like that, then I feel like a lot of the things that you think or do are just feel completely insignificant. And yeah, in the grand scheme of things, given how big the universe is, we are smaller than a speck of dust. But like the way that society works is that it's not built on the assumption that we think on that grander scale. <laughs> but that's, that's just what I think. Your Twitch profile picture is literally Siri hugging the MC, and that's how dedicated I am to Doki Doki Literature Club. It's a good game. Also, you don't need to post it three times, by the way. Like, it's fine. And he puts a kiss on her forehead because, what a chat. There's a slight time skip now, I think it's like two weeks later. Okay everyone, what a track.
I'm also of the opinion that the universe could end at any time, or that this could all just be memories when you're living in the past. Well, to me, if the universe is going to end at any time, you might as well make the most of what you have. No point living in fear of something that could happen. This is classic Yuri inability to understand a joke. Although, in Yuri's route, she does get better at understanding humour, so we didn't want to write her as an idiot or like someone that's not very emotionally intelligent in the context of jokes. <laughs> oh, Yuri. Why are you so smart, but at the same time... Ugh. Sometimes not so. Like call back to, to, to Monica's route, where she has really high expectations and she has to juggle not just exams but also extracurriculars, and it's uh, it's difficult to juggle those. Yeah, Yuri be figuring out so he has depression but not telling anyone is very in character. I couldn't. Yeah, I I I, I don't think that, with the exception of maybe Natsuki, I don't think that any of the Dokis would tell. All the dokies they found out. Who knows? Well, not even Natsuki probably wouldn't. I don't know. It's hard to say. I don't know. Don't know Natsuki too well. Christmas party! <sighs> Yay! <laughs> Monica's not happy to think about how they broke into the school. <laughs> I think this is the Christmas scene, so we've got two days left. Yeah, it is. Oh, Christmas music. Some good shit. Secret Santa idea. The snow effect. Oh, I really do like how that turned out. It's a simple little addition that uh, Chris wants to put in. There's, there's rain and snow. I think it just looks... It helps the kind of scene look more alive. Which is nice. I think the the music track that was inspiration for this one was if you guys have ever played Banjo Kazooie, uh, the level Click Clockwood. It has a winter variant, and that was the inspiration. But I don't think we actually used that because the track sounds nothing like it. Because I wanted to include sleigh bells, finger snaps, but that was never used. Still, I'm really happy with what we got in the end, but. Yeah, it does have a swing tempo, so which is not what we were going for, but it works, so whatever. This is a background that our artist, Serki, made. Um, there are quite a few variants of this downtown street background, but I think this looks absolutely beautiful. Snow everywhere, softly falling down, it looks like a Christmas Wonderland, basically. It's really nice. I think Yuri, being someone who's not a fan of crowds, is something that I think is in character as well. Yeah, it's one of the nicest backgrounds. It's definitely up there. I think the, um, the, the Halloween um, school is also my favourite as well. Also this Yuri coat looks really nice. She has that kind of detective vibe going on with it, I approve. <laughs>
and this nice little DDLC motif here. Oh, it's so nice. Oh, I love season seasonified versions of DDLC. It's wonderful. And yes, music, lyrics being a form of poetry is something that I thought was a really interesting uh, point for Yumi to discuss. Talking about Freddie Mercury and how, you know, his personality on stage and out of stage is very different. Just goes to show the effect of music on not just the listener, but also the performer. Okay, so there are two references in this background. For those of you that have played Danganronpa, the blood stain being pink is a very Danganronpa thing. And the little symbol to the right of the guitar is actually a symbol that's on um, Ibuki's, the character Ibuki's clothes. It's a nice little two-in-one reference that Chris put in there. I think this background looks fine, Chris. I don't know what you don't like about it. It's got a nice little dang and roll reference there. It's a very nice background. Also, what kind of music would Sayuri listen to? That's a thinking point. Okay, so I think Xenoblade knows exactly what's going to come up here, but this was written at a time when I was obsessed with the police. Looking back on it, I kind of wish that I wasn't. But anyway, this is a song uh, that when I was listening to it, I felt like it, it, it described um, base game Monica extremely well. Uh, where basically someone uh, is cut off from the outside world. Uh, with no one to save them, despite their efforts. Until one day they realise that there are other people also sharing in its loneliness. Um, the power of loneliness, stemming from an individual cut off from the real world, desperately seeking someone to rescue them. Um, I think, yes, it's on the nose, but I think if there was a song that on paper described Monica's situation, that would basically be it. <clears throat> I didn't just put it in there because I, I loved the police at the time, I legit thought that that song was the perfect description of base game Monica. Although I probably would have toned it down if I wrote The Room now, but I think we've all got things we want to improve on. I think getting Monica a vinyl is a good idea. She's into music. Okay, oh, that background should not be that background. That should be a different light coming through the windows. Whatever. <clears throat> so, okay. <laughs> Everyone in the DDLC community knows about Yuri and pens. Um, so I, I didn't want to be too explicit. Or too obvious with the references here. Um, but she does have a point where she says that they are quite rare. Most people do use biros or ballpoint pens. And an MC says <laughs> if he was um, Secret Santa, that's probably what he'd get her. I never actually listened to much of Wrapped Around Your Finger. Funnily enough. Also, there are no pens here. This is a library. You wouldn't find a pen here. But you have to be a bit creative with the backgrounds that you have. <laughs> I mean, what, e what exactly can you do with a pen? <laughs> I thought I was so funny. I, I, I'm, I'm really sad. Help me.
Yeah, nice green and black. Very nice. We've all experienced the uh, difficulty of knowing what to get someone for a, for a birthday or a Christmas present. You know, he's just saying that like don't get a notebook or a pen because they're not really personal. Even though she did just get a pen for Monica, but oops, that's a minor plot hole that we need to avoid. Although, in my defence, I want to point out that the MC Siri relationship is much deeper than the Yuri Monica one, so. Yano. The age old dilemma, indeed. I'm not sure if you could order these on the internet, I guess maybe get it from Amazon, but realistically I wrote him saying you can download it off the internet to basically avoid having to get a new uh, shop background, because it's very, very difficult to get the right backgrounds for shopping. Like, we had to change a lot of the scenes and the writing and pay for um, backgrounds specifically for background sake, so I kind of had to get a bit creative to get around that issue. Um, what time signature this is in? I don't know. Mr. P.A. wrote this one, I think. Yeah, Mr. P.A. wrote this one. So, and he's not in the chat right now, so... We'll never know. Christmas! So, this is a lovely background that our resident artist, Serky, made. Um... I think it's a little bit too Western for a Japanese house. But, it's nice enough, it gets the job done. I like the roaring fireplace. Um, and the, the pictures on the mantelpiece are references to animes. I think one of them is Saitama. Yeah, that one's Saitama. I, I, not sure the one on the right or the left, though. I'm sure people that know anime more than I do can figure that one out. <clears throat> Wait, that's a good point. He's watching TV. What's he watching it on? <laughs> the more I play through Blue Skies, <laughs> the more I realise the problems that it has. Fuck me. Don't like it. Also, this is the last day after this Act 3 starts, so we'll be cutting the stream after this. The TV on the left? Am I blind? Do I just not see a TV? There's a TV in the cabinet? Is there? Um, I don't see the TV, but... Yeah, neither can I. But there's a TV! There's a TV. Yes, there is. Sure. <laughs> no, there's, there's no... It's in the fireplace. <laughs> yeah, let's just not think too much about that. Also, of the four Dokis, I can definitely imagine Sayori being the most excited about uh, Valentine's Day. Ah, uh, Valentine's Day? Uh, Christmas. Presents and all that stuff. Blah, 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 romantic, soppy, soppy stuff. Chris had the wonderful idea to, to blur, to, to make the background dark and have the, the doki zoom in whenever you're about to kiss them, which I thought was a nice little touch.
classic Doki Doki blue balling. Oh yeah, Christmas version of your reality. Awkwardly looped. Need to get that fixed for the next patch. <laughs> so that's Suki saying, oh, it was really easy finding presents. And then Monica's like, well, you're like, why don't you go first then? She's like, fuck. Peace Lily, um, that is a reference to a movie, people that know me will know the reference, people that don't won't. That's very cryptic, I know. Also, I like how this shows that the relationship between these two girls has come forward a bit in that, you know, Natsuki's actually buying presents for Yuri and quite thoughtful presents as well. You know, she, she didn't just get her a book or, or like a knife, she actually got her something that would help her read the atmosphere. She knows that Yuri's all about the atmosphere. That's a very thoughtful present for Natsuki. Just like, bro, it's just a plant. <laughs> that is an awful loop, Jesus Christ. How did that ever get put through? Jesus. A spice rank. Yeah, because Monica and her parents are fucking loaded, so. You can afford a nice, expensive present. Pen is a, a safe choice. Ah, uh, puddle of ink. Funny. God damn. So she gets him a framed photograph uh, of them as kids, which is really nice. Now, you do actually see what the photograph looks like, but only in the bad ending. Now, because there are some of you here that don't want to do the bad ending, I'll show you the CG now, out of context, so you don't have to see it. But that's, uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, although there are some, uh... Oh, shit! Twitch! Fuck! That's a problem. <laughs> I didn't realise it would do that! Fuck! <laughs> oh, man! That's a problem. Um... Oh, shit, that was only like three seconds. So, it should be alright, right? Is it possible to, like, cut that out? Oh, fuck's sake. It's it's fine. It's only like three seconds. They won't do anything. Hopefully. God damn it! I really hope they don't do anything about it. Uh, I didn't realize that clicking on the CG would play the next one. Fuck! I can't delete the vod. It's three hours long. 
Chris, I accidentally clicked on the uh, bad ending CG, and that makes it go to the next one, which is the H scene. So, fuck. Um, Chris, you're gonna have to make sure to save this VOD after it's done. Are they really gonna do that for like two seconds of nudity by accident? Like, how are they even gonna find it? Yeah, we'll be deleting it on YouTube, don't worry. I really don't think they're gonna find it. Like, it, 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 it's like three hours, this stream, and it happens for three seconds at the end. It's gonna be fine. But, save the video clips just in case if you can. At least it wasn't the Yuri one, because that one's a little bit more explicit. <laughs> yeah, bottles. Lights. I think this is the only route where you actually see the Christmas present given. Yeah, it is. Which is a shame. It would be nice to, to give it to, to more people. Also, if you upload it to YouTube, you could probably edit out the CG. Because you could download the video and edit it and then upload it. But I really don't think YouTube are going to care. Three seconds in a three hour long stream. Girls all like to skip, which is nice. <laughs> you really do live a wild lifestyle, don't you? Hey man, playing Trivial Pursuit or Scrabble, me and the boys, I could gladly play that. Maybe it's just me. Natsuki's not a fan of video games. Rude. Yeah, you can censor it with whatever you want. I'm not going to comment on this because it speaks for itself. It's very obvious. The Monica question is actually a reference to Danganronpa. B3. Don't worry, Chris, it won't make sense out of context, so it's not a spoiler. But, uh, for those of you who have played V3 that happen to be in the chat, I, I can't say too much more, because I know so you probably haven't. But if you know, you know. Don't worry, Chris, nothing's been spoiled. You also need to play that game, by the way. You've got no excuse now, bro. Blah, blah, blah. This is just kind of skippable. Oh, this is me saying... Being funny. Talking about the major arteries in the forearm and wrist. Oh, uh, yeah, funny, because she cut herself. Oh, it's so funny! We're just chilling in the in the living room now. Oh, this <laughs> this part was really fun, sorry, because it again shows kind of like the the mischievous side of Sayori. So the part where Monica and Sayori leave the room and start whispering, and it looks a little bit suspicious. And he's just asking like, "What are you guys up to?" And she's like, "Oh, you'll find out soon. Don't worry." They're trying to hold a poker face. Well, as much of a poker face as they can hold. It's 
stream's literally about to end after this day, Purple Nerd, but fair enough. Have a good one. I think at this point, when someone says look up and it's Christmas Day and people are acting funny, you just know what's going to happen. Oh no. That's mistletoe, bro! Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote a garble on the ceiling? Yes. I think this is definitely one of the nicest CGs in the mod. The... The... Shading... The lighting, everything is perfect. It's really nice. The mistletoe as well. Personally, I'm more of a fan of the Act 2 Yuri CG uh, because of the background. Uh, I think that looks nicer. But I think the actual characters themselves look nicer in this in this CG. It's a very nice, sweet CG. I think having the, the, the little clothes tag on the back of the MC's shirt is a nice little detail. Childhood sweethearts, eh? That almost sounds like a trope. <laughs> well, it was in the original game, Monica, and you killed her off. Oh, Natsuki. Ah, <laughs> you're... Mm, Siri's face. <laughs> and Yuri's face. I do like Natsuki's humour. I have to admit. And here, it was... One of the criticisms we I got with writing Act 2 was that there wasn't enough of a hook to pull you into Act 3 because this scene where Sayuri asks you was it okay for us to kiss wasn't in there. I think it was Chris that said maybe add some, some uncertainty on Sayuri's part saying yeah they've kissed but like was it okay to do that and MC needs to reassure her and he says he's reassuring her but he's wondering to himself like what's this going to be like. Which I thought it was a good idea to kind of pull the reader into Act 3 otherwise it sounds a little bit oh we kissed it's perfect there's not much to pull you in. So that was a nice little bit of constructive uh, criticism there that helped make the end of Act 2 just a little bit better. It's been a long while, long time Chris. Not so much jarring, just to kind of make the hook from Act 2 to Act 3 be a little bit stronger because if it just ended with them kissing and that was it without this scene it would feel like oh that's how it ended it seems a little bit too perfect so it's nice to have this kind of looming uncertainty even during a really happy part of their uh, relationship and they kiss How does she nuzzle his nose when she doesn't even have one? That's a lie. Yeah, so him saying, all of this feels like absolute bliss, a part of me can't help but wonder what I'm getting myself into. It would be naive for me to think that everything will be sunshine and rainbows from here on out, no matter how strong we feel for each other. Will we really be okay? Yeah, we used the CG twice for. It's nice CG, so fuck it, you'll live. Do 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 do
Act three, Into the Unknown. I, I like the symbolism. The two umbrellas and the raining. I was really proud of how that turned out. Okay, that's where we're gonna, um, that's where we're gonna call it. That's act three. Yeah, so that was the stream. Glad you guys liked it. Hopefully Twitch won't uh, take it down because I showed some boobies by accident. Um, next stream, we'll be making a good amount of progress through Act 3. Uh, I hope we'll be able to make it to the good end split because I don't want to do... These are fun to do, but they do take up a lot of time. So we should have... The next stream will take us... Yeah, we will. Don't worry. These, these VODs will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, Next stream will take us to the, the part where the route splits into the good and bad ending. And the stream after that will do both endings. The good ending first, so that people who, who don't want to cry can watch that and then call it there. Um, and the bad ending will open and do that after that. And then after that, um, it seems like this is going pretty well. So um, I might want to do Yuri's. Um, I want to do that with, with Brit because obviously she wrote that with me, but she's quite busy at the moment, so I don't know if I'll have the time to do it. So it might happen later, I'm not sure. Um, probably won't do a Natsuki uh, route because um, the Natsuki writer isn't here anymore. Not Tiffany, there was a guy that wrote most of it, or, or Act 2 at least, who's now gone, so that'll be impossible to get a hold of him. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, hopefully this won't get banned, because I showed a bit of tits. Uh, yeah, so catch you in the next one. Not sure when that'll be, probably sometime next week. So, ciao.